Hello and welcome to the worship services of Good Samaritan Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you with us wherever you are and whenever you are watching. We hope that you will find here a place to encounter the Spirit of God as it moves in the world, to hear the Word, and to lift up all the ways in which we see God at work in this world of ours. As our call to worship this morning, I have a bit of a peculiar selection. Um, peculiar because I seriously doubt that the author would have ever considered his work being used in the context of a Christian worship service. Um, but it just so happens that not only the, the content of the poem, but also the, the, the author's likely response to it being used in this context is fitting for our consideration today of Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch and the chaos of the early church movement and the Pentecostal fire that, that overwhelmed so many people in uh, so many of the disciples in those early days. Um, the, the poem in question is called Miracle. It's by Charles Bukowski. Uh, if you're at all familiar with Mr. Bukowski, you probably think, what? That's, it does seem odd for a church service, and indeed it does. Um, I actually, on a whim, was sort of searching for confessional uh, prayer or poem from Bukowski because he is often very frank and honest about confessing his own depravity and his own brokenness and reflecting upon what that means. But I was surprised to find something that, that fit more into the general uh, theme of something that, that is spontaneous and joyful and moves with grace that is unexpected. Um, and so I offer you as our Call to Worship, Miracle, by Charles Bukowski. I have just listened to this symphony, which Mozart dashed off in one day. And it had enough wild and crazy joy to last forever. Whatever forever is, Mozart came as close as possible. Let's pray. Lord, we do not know and we can only speculate what forever is. The expanse of eternity is something that, that as Ecclesiastes tells us, is set in our hearts, but we, we can't really comprehend it. And so we leave that comprehension to you and we trust that when we come to see things as you see them and live in that place where that Jesus called the kingdom of heaven that we will have some understanding and compassion for what it means to last forever to live forever and we hope lord that we will have joy that is big enough and full enough to fill that space we may only see it, hear it in expressions of art, like poems and symphonies and paintings. We may only see little bits and pieces of it, but we see in the story of all that has been and all that is coming that it is possible if we will let go of our need to control everything and just allow your wild, ecstatic, uncontrollable spirit to move in our lives. And so, Lord, we, we pray that that spirit would move in us, inspire us, encourage us, and lead us along whatever road we are supposed to be on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turning from the unexpected, the wild, and perhaps the, the, the slightly inappropriate Mr. Bukowski, we turn to the ever so organized and predictable and structured poetry of a different age.
by Samuel Johnson. The call to confession that, that invites us to consider our own brokenness is an excerpt from a, a poem by Mr. Johnson called The Vanity of Human Wishes. As we come into the presence of God, as, as we lay, seek to lay down our burdens, consider, again, as Ecclesiastes tells us, that all is vanity in chasing after the wind. And then we will know that freedom is the ability to lay down that vanity and to see what God is doing. And so we come to confess. Come to confess with joy. Come to confess without shame. And we know that this forgiveness that God gives us is not only so wonderful that we can't comprehend its depth and its width, but it is also something that, that we can truly trust and accept freely. Where then shall hope and fear their objects find? Must dull suspense corrupt the stagnant mind? Must helpless man in ignorance sedate roll darkling down the torrent? His feet. Must no dislike alarm, no wishes rise, no cries attempt the mercies of the skies. Inquirer cease. Petitions yet remain, which heaven may hear, nor deem religion vain. Still raise for good the supplicating voice, but leave to heaven the measure and the choice. Safe in his power, whose eyes discern afar the secret ambush of a specious prayer. Implore his aid in his decision's rest. Secure whate'er he gives, he gives the best. Friends, God indeed does give the best. And if it were up to us, we would probably construct a great list of unforgivable things. But God instead, by applying his grace and his mercy, and coming alongside all the pain and destruction that our sin brings into his good creation, does not see anything as impossible. Does not count anything beyond the reach of mercy and love. And so the good news of the gospel is that God has welcomed us sinners home as the father welcomed the prodigal. And so we are free and we are loved and we are welcome. And that is a grace which even if we cannot comprehend, we are called to imitate, and to give thanks for in all aspects of our lives. In Jesus' name, the good news we are forgiven. The scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, an official of the court, oh, the official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. 
Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with, the scripture, with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus as he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading from God's holy word. It was actually a little hard to, to pick between the, the, the scripture passages from the lectionary for this week. I, I went back and forth. There, there were some... There were some good ones this week. The gospel was about Jesus being the true vine, and, and that's, that's a good one. It's a good parable. It's, it's important for us to remember. And, and the epistle was from John. It was about God, the, God's love and, and abiding in that love and abiding in God, which also connects to the gospel of the abiding in the true vine. But, but I, I guess, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for the strange stories in scripture. When they, when they come along, I, I have a hard time turning them down, these little excerpts of things that, that are, well, honestly, like kind of stranger than fiction almost. And that's, and, that, and that's what really gives them the ring of truth, is that they're, they're just so random and odd and also important. I mean, you know... It, the, the scriptures that we have, the Gospels, are all organized in a certain way to tell a certain story. Acts certainly has a, has a structure to it, and it, and it has a a message that it's trying to get out there. But even in in the the context of of the author trying to relate to us in a, in a somewhat orderly way, the development of this life that we call the church, this living thing that 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 was referred to as the Ecclesia, the gathering of the people. There are these sort of random, manic, charismatic kind of moments that, that happen. There's this chaos that just breaks through. I mean, Pentecost is, is, is one example, but, but here, I mean, just, just think about what happens to Philip. I mean, he's just minding his own business, and the Spirit tells him you need to go out here to the, on the road to Gaza in the middle of nowhere. Why? Like, why not go to a town? Why not go to a specific spot? But no, he needs to go out in, 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 in a, one of the more desolate spots in the world. And, and just, I don't tell you what's going to happen, just go to that place. And, and he encounters a, a person that is just strange and, and challenging to him in so many different ways. And, and then, you know, he does, he does the thing that seems like he needs to do at that time, and then it's just he just vanished, sort of, you know, gets whisked away by the spirit. <laughs> it's it's peculiar. I mean, this this it just happens without a lot of exposition. We don't really, This is one of the, we don't hear a lot about Philip, honestly, before or after this. We 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 know a little bit about him, but this like this is this is the thing. He just he's zoomed in and zoomed out. It's you know it's almost it's almost like you know something you, you would. You would read in a, a story about wizards or something like that. Yeah, but the, the energy of, of, the, of the age of the apostles and, and the book of Acts is, is very much like that. It's, just, it's this rushing wind, you know? It, it's, it's this constantly throwing down challenges to, to the people who think, you're, think they're starting to get it figured out. To, to, to the apostles like Philip and Peter and Paul, they just... Like every time they think they have a grasp on this thing, it's just whew, the wind just takes them where where they can't imagine they would have gone on their own. And so, 
I guess, you know, living the life that, that, that I live now in, in, you know, in 21st century America with material comforts and, and serving a, a, a suburban congregation and standing in the Presbyterian tradition, it's all about being decent and in order. I, I guess these, these sort of random wild encounters spark something. It definitely interests me. Just this, the same way that this sort of gritty poetry of, of Mr. Bukowski challenges me and grips me and, and draws me in. I mean, it, you know, it's edgy, and, and there there is a there is an edginess about the, the the gospel story and and the, the the life of the early church. It's it's not predictable and. and yeah, it, these are the kind of things that I like to bring up whenever I get into conversations with people who say that oh, I'm not really into organized religion. And I, I, you know, my cheap, sort of cheeky response is, "Well, I'm not either. I'm coming to Christianity. It's nothing like an organized religion." Well, it, at least it wasn't. And I guess in some ways, if you if you want to if you want to look at how we actually do this thing called church, maybe it's not as organized as it seems on the surface. Yeah, but. I I get it. I, I get what people are rejecting when they're saying organized religion. I, I, I want to reject organized religion a lot of times myself. But there is a very important nugget of truth that we all need to understand, whether we are comfortable 21st century Americans or 1st century uh, you know, people who didn't really even understand what they were, what they were calling themselves yet. We, we need to know <clears throat> that we're not in control of this thing. And, and, that, and that's kind of important because if, if we think we're in control of it, if we think we've harnessed the, the mighty rushing wind of God's spirit, then, well, <laughs> we, we're probably either, we're, we're either going to get a smack upside the head or we're just going to be abandoned by that spirit because it, it will not be held in whatever holy of holies we want to construct for it. It, it wants to get out there into in, on the road in the wilderness places and find these distant, these dis different people, the, these people that are challenging in so many ways. And it wants to bring them into the gracious presence of God. You know, contrary to what Presbyterians might lead you to believe, Robert's Rules of Order is not in the Scripture. It's not even in the Apocrypha. The organized part of this religion of ours is is is, is has its importance and it has its function and it keeps us on, on, on the road to institutional maintenance, but we wouldn't have made it really this far, no matter how organized we happen to be, if it wasn't for the breathing, living life of God's Spirit in, our, in, in the midst of all of our attempts at organization. There's all, the God's, God's Spirit always moves in ways that are going to seem surprising and random to us and we at this point we we should learn to expect that when you encounter strange folks to fight the urge that most of us have to just, you know oh, they're different than me but instead you know, ask yourself what what is to prevent them from hearing and knowing the truth of God's grace you know the the Phil, you know, Phil, the, the, the question that the eunuch asks in, in is sort of, you know, towards the end of this story, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? That question to me just rings out. Because I, you know, I think Philip probably had lots of things in his mind that might have kept this person from being baptized. Philip probably had lots of lots of answers he could have given to that question that, that would have put this encounter to a sad, shameful end. If Philip were to respond from his own sense of things, he probably could have come up with, with well, the, the, the eunuch's physical state. He, he was a person, they were a person who had been physically altered. Not... Not probably by choice, which also means that they were probably a person who was owned 
slave, a <laughs> servant, I mean slave, servant, in those days the line was pretty thin. <laughs> and and eunuchs, eunuchs were created because they, they, were, they were seen as being more trustworthy on one hand, particularly to serve, if it was a male person to begin with, to serve a female sovereign or royal, a queen, so that they don't get ideas and they can be trusted, intimate servants. But, but also they were, they were made because the, the commitments and the embroilments of having a, a family and the loyalties that, that you might be tempted to give to your own children and your own wife and your, your own relations could lead you astray, particularly if you had a position like being in charge of the money of an entire kingdom. So they were changed. That's a you know, it's a pretty drastic change. It's a thing that that on the one hand made them see, seem more trustworthy, but also always set them apart from normal people. They were marginalized by society. Even if they wielded great power, they, they were never probably going to be completely and totally accepted as just being ordinary folk. And, and as an Ethiopian, a foreigner, a Gentile, but one who was curious about Israel's religion, who had been to Jerusalem to worship in the temple, but wasn't allowed into the inner court of the temple, but just to see it from a distance and, and to, 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 to get for himself the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and, and be reading from it and trying to understand it but apparently not having much luck understanding it. And so this is the, this is the place where, where Philip comes in to the story, out there in the middle of nowhere, on the road to Gaza, he sees this person coming. This person driving along in a chariot, obviously of a different social class and economic caste than Philip himself. Having a chariot was was no small thing. It's not like you know the way most of us own cars. It was a it was a status and a, and a level of wealth that folks like Philip probably looked at and said, "Wow, this person is really something else." And then to encounter them as being foreign and, and a Gentile and a eunuch and all of the things that just pile on top of one another and make this person so very other. And this, the, the thing that the, the, the eunuch is reading it has to resonate with, with his, their identity. I mean, the, the one who is despised and cut down, the one who is the one who suffers, but the one who doesn't open their mouth and protest. had to think that there was something resonated with them personally, maybe. And, and, you know, at this point, Peter has not had his vision of the gent of Gentile inclusion, and Paul wasn't on the scene yet. So Philip had only the vaguest notion that the gospel was supposed to go to people such as this, those others, those Gentiles. I think it's safe to say that this question of what's to keep me from being baptized probably <laughs> probably resonated with Philip in a, in a strange sort of a way, but it didn't stop him. The Spirit gave him the answer. The Spirit said absolutely nothing is to keep this person from being baptized. I, I admit this sort of wanton, carefree admission to the covenant of baptism makes me a bit nervous. The, <clears throat> the priest in me, the practitioner of institutional religion, wants to say, 
no, 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 it has to be some kind of order. We have to do, we have to have some kind of rules. We can't just do this in some puddle by the side of the road. Ow, that's not adequate preparation. That's not, there's no adequate understanding. There has to be some kind of standard. Honestly, I, 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 I'll tell you, I need to tell that dude to shut up <laughs> quite often. Think back to our anti-organized religion folks. The types that the German theologian and guy with a fun name to bandy about in conversation, Friedrich Schleiermacher, Friedrich Schleiermacher, it's fun to say, it's a little difficult to say, calls the cultured despisers of religion. What is it that they generally despise about religion? <laughs> it's, it's the fact that that it doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's making a bunch of rules that no one really can follow or wants to follow. Oddly enough, that's the same criticism that Jesus had of the religious folks of his day. They were tying up heavy burdens that were too hard to bear. The, 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 the assumption is, is that once organized religion gets unmoored from the living, breathing spirit of God, that it it goes dead. It, it's, it, it becomes not only, does not, no longer contains the transformational experience of God, but it, but it actually stunts our ability to encounter that. Like the things that happen on, on the road to Gaza just can't seem to happen in, under the tall steeple of a, of a cathedral or a, a, an enormous old impressive church when we start trying to maintain the institution we have this tendency to choke the life out of the whole thing anyone who has ever found themselves on the outside looking in anyone who has ever been on the receiving end of the self-interest of the powerful, anyone who has ever had their back against the wall, well, they experience the message of the gospel a little differently than those who are mostly doing just fine. Authentic faith in Jesus drowns in the lap of luxury. You just don't need it if you're already privileged, well-fed, and secure. There's, there's, there, it doesn't have any urgency to you. You might think it seems reasonable. You might think, think it seems like something, well, I can get along with that. I can get, I can get on board with that. I can, I can go do some good works, and I can go listen to some neat stories, and, and, and I can consider myself to, to be a, a, a person of faith. Because, you know, even as the world as it is now, we still think being a person of faith is, is a good thing. But the Ethiopian eunuch was open to the words of the prophet in a way, and the message of the gospel in a way that most people probably didn't quite get. Not despite their marginalized identity, but because of it. They had, and the this person had economic power and security. They were not on the bottom of the heap in a lot of ways, but they were always other. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to always that you always have to be on the bottom of every pile to get it, but you probably do need to know what it, what it feels like and what it seems like to look from the outside to really understand gospel is about. And when I say understand it, I mean understand it on a level that will lead you to, to, to follow it. And, and, and you know, that's, that's the other thing that sort of makes the institutionalist in me a little nervous is, is that Philip baptizes this guy, this person, and then just, boom, he's gone. He doesn't get to do any follow-up training or any catechism classes or anything like that. It's just you baptize, and then he goes on his way. He's got to go back to his queen and back to his, his pagan world. And what preparation does he have for that? Hmm. 
Zero. But he has the Holy Spirit with him. Even though we, we only see one afternoon in this person's life, God was at work in every day of it. And, and that's, that, that, that may seem a little shocking. God was at work in the way that they were enslaved. God was at work in the way that they were altered. Their conversion and their baptism may be the thing that we, we read about in, this, in, in the Acts of, of the Apostles, but their life as a child of God before, during, and after this event They abide in the true vine. They are enfolded in the, the, the love of God that is in all things. They heard that reality in the words of the prophet, even when they didn't understand totally the historical context, even when they didn't know about the covenant with Israel, even when they didn't know about the expectation of a Messiah, and they certainly didn't know about this person, Jesus, that Philip was going to tell them about. They had to get past all the reasons they probably had deeply internalized about their their own sense of otherness and even the desperation of their position and accept the identity of a beloved child of God that abided in the presence of that love in this world. That kind of radical love is not easy to institutionalize because it, it, and that's why church so often falls short of the gospel. At some point we are faced with a choice. Either we, we accept a God who is big enough and loving enough to embrace someone that is very different from you. Doesn't check all the boxes of what you think someone ought to be. Someone that may push you outside your normal comfort zone. And if you think this was a comfortable encounter for Philip, you're not paying attention. Try to reduce God down to something that you're comfortable with with, and, and someone that loves what you love and values what you value. You are making God into an image of yourself rather than recognizing the image of God that you are made in. The problem with doing that is that you then end up on the wrong side of things. You are not abiding in the true vine and you are assuming that you are the true vine. When you create God in your own image, you are not opening yourself up to the love of God and the love that is God. You're trying to fit your own illusion of God's love into some sort of container that you can manage and feel okay about. If Philip had a notion about what the character, what a character like the Ethiopian eunuch might have done with the message, once he took it back to the, 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 the place where he came from and the, the, the royal house that he was a servant of, Well, there's no way of telling how he was going to take that message and interpret that message and live out that message. Philip just knew he wasn't going to get to be in control of that, but that didn't stop him for one second. He knew. This moment of baptism was was full of the joy and the wild, full of the wild and crazy joy eternity. He knew that if this, this message that he gave, had given this man in, in a few hours was going to go to a different culture. And who knows what, it was, what form it was going to take. I mean, it was being put into a vessel that was so very different than any of the Galilean Jews that it had been put into so far. <laughs> it's being put into Gentile vessel, a eunuch vessel, uh, an exotic person from a far off land. Who knows what might happen? Who knows indeed? That's, that's the thing. I mean, 
if, if we're going to try to control it too tightly, it's not going to work. It's, it's, not, it's not our job to control it too tightly. It is not our job to make sure that everybody gets it exactly the same way and says, says the exact same creeds and, and memorizes the same catechisms. We have, made that our, we have made that our job. I mean, we've taken that role for ourselves over the centuries, haven't we? But where does it get us? It gets us dead. It gets us dried up. It gets us tired. It gets us worn out. It gets us ineffective. When are we going to learn to let God's Spirit breathe in us? When are we going to accept that, that, it's, that it's not supremely important that we make it make everything so crystal clear and doctrinally pure? When are we going to let the saving of souls and the changing of lives be up to God's Spirit? Not up to our own perfection. See, that's, that's the thing that I think gets us about sharing the gospel, isn't it? We think, well, well, I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't, I'm not good and I don't have enough scripture memorized. I don't know exactly what the right way to do it is. Because there is no right way to do it. There is the way that you can share the love of God in Jesus Christ as it has touched your life and then there's the way that everybody else, that, that each individual person does it as well. I mean, it, it makes it probably makes for bad religion, honestly. This is, there's no system to it. You just have to follow where the Spirit leads you. If it says go to the wilderness road, go to the wilderness road. If it sends you to Azotus, go to Azotus. If it puts you in Caesarea, go to Caesarea. If it tells you to talk to this person who frightens the living daylights out of you, Talk to that person that frightens the living daylights out of you. If it tells you to get down into a puddle by the side of the road with somebody who you who you you don't know and you barely met, and you and they ask you this question, "What is to keep me from being baptized?" and you have this long list of things in your mind that that are reasons that they should be kept from being baptized. Give it up. Let it go. It is, it, it's terrible religion. It's, it's not decent and in order. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow the creeds and the catechisms. But it is good. Jesus following. It is filled with the Spirit. I, I believe that one of the things that can save us from the death of our religion is that it, we need to learn to let the Spirit live in here with us. And that may sometimes seem like chaos. It may sometimes seem just a little less predictable than we would generally like it to be. And, and I know this seems odd coming from a Presbyterian, but maybe we need to be a little bit more disorganized. Maybe we need to open our ears to voices that don't seem like they're coming from inside our camp. Maybe we need to open our ears to voices that, that don't come from the safe and secure circles where we find ourselves. Because that may just be the voice of our shepherd calling us out, leading us to green pastures and beside still waters. And, and you know, warning, fair warning, there may be odd folks out there. They may not look like you think they should look. They may not talk like you think they should talk. They are. They are God's children as well. And the gospel is good news for them as it is for us.
And the prophets speak to their lives as they speak to our lives. And Jesus is the Savior of of them as he is of us. It challenges us, and it should, always. It should challenge us to be a little less afraid of the different. A little more willing to love them as they are our brothers and sisters. Let's be brave enough to be a little more disorganized and let the fire of the Spirit move us where it will. Along the road and into the towns, into the chariots, and into the waters of baptism. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the chaos of your spirit, for that mighty rushing wind that often takes us and sets us down in places where we are confronted with things that make us uncomfortable, whether it is a vision of a valley full of dry bones, or whether it is a person that just seems so very different from us. Remind us, Lord, that that is the way that your spirit moves. And if we are too comfortable with it, then we're probably not really moving with your spirit. If it seems familiar and easy, it probably is not the way that Jesus is calling us. If it is challenging and full of grace and the need to reach out beyond our little bubble, then it just very well may be the path of discipleship. We thank you for the strangeness of the story. We thank you for the way it can pull things in from the very edges of the world. The way that the good news echoes to the very coastlands. The way that the good news finds people on the wilderness road explains and breathes life into them in a way that they could not have come to on their own. We pray, Lord, that this church, both the the local congregation and the church in the world, would learn to be a little more comfortable with that energy that crazy, wild energy that goes on forever. We need, we need it. We need it to fill us, we need it to inspire us, we need it to draw us along the way. Or else we will wither as the grass and the flowers of the field. If we are connected to the true vine, then we know that, 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 that what seems like chaos to us is not chaos at all. It is simply love that is deeper and wider and wilder than we can imagine on our own. It is not destructive and random. It is rather supremely focused on drawing all things in to the kingdom of heaven. Showing all of creation to be the good and loving act of a good and loving God. So Lord, in in that spirit, we, we take words that seem so very familiar, but we we ask, Lord, that your spirit would fill us as we pray these, these words that are familiar, but 
we ask, Lord, that, that you would let them ring in our hearts with an energy that is not that does not come just from being able to say them by root, but comes from praying them as an expression of what you are doing and what you are calling us to do in our lives. And so we say together this prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you are going, God is sending you. Wherever you are now, he has a reason for you to be there. Jesus Christ, who lives in you, has something he wants you to do right here, right now, where you are. Believe this and go in his grace, his mercy, his love, and his power. God's people said,